Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's program. Now, the rat lungworm parasite, Angiostrongulus cantonensis, is typically transmitted to humans via the ingestion of snails or slugs. But a recent study published in One Health shows that more than a dozen kinds of animals, in addition to slugs and snails, have caused rat lungworm disease in people around the world. Well, joining me today to take a look at the rat lungworm and the One Health study is Robert Cowie, PhD. Dr. Cowie is a senior author on the study and a faculty member at the University of Hawaii Manoa School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology. Dr. Cowie, welcome to the program, sir. Thanks for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. Oh, you're more than welcome. And of course, parasitology is kind of my love. So I, I found this very interesting. Um, and I, I actually learned quite a bit out of it because I thought it was strictly snails and slugs mm -hmm. uh, until I read the paper. Um, so let's let's go ahead, before we jump into the study, let's go ahead and take a look at the parasite, Angiostrongulus cantonensis. Um, can you talk about this roundworm? Sure. It's it's a roundworm, as you say. And the scientific name for roundworm is nematodes. Um, the name of this species tells you where it came from, or at least where it was first described. Cantonensis means that it came from the city of Canton in southern China, now known as Guangzhou. Um, it's, as you say, it's a nematode, a roundworm, and its common name is the rat lungworm. Uh, it is the cause of human disease, as you mentioned, um, which manifests as a disease called eosinophilic meningitis, which is an infection of the nervous system, particularly the brain. Um, and um, the key, uh, the key um, sort of manifestation of that is a high number of so-called eosinophils in the, um, um, in the spinal fluid. Mm -hmm. And, um, in any case, the parasite uh, was discovered in Guangzhou in 1933, and it was found in the heart and, uh, and pulmonary arteries of rats, um, hence its common name, rat lungworm, because um, the pulmonary arteries are what feed the, the lungs from the heart. And, um, it wasn't at that time associated with any kind of human disease. It wasn't until 1944 when someone actually died in Taiwan as a result of contracting this disease and becoming infected by the parasite. But at that time, the people who were dealing with that patient didn't put two and two together and did not realize that the, the worm was the cause of um, the, the person's illness and, and subsequent death. And it wasn't, in fact, until the early 1960s here in Hawaii, um, the parasite had got here um, somehow. And it, uh, two people, in fact, were, became sick and ultimately died. And on auto autopsy, they were found to have worms in their brains. And the, the researchers put two and two together and realized that these um, symptoms that caused the death of the, the, the patients were in fact associated with this worm. And that was in like 1960, 61, 62. Um, so the parasite is, um, as I said, it was discovered in Guangzhou, southern China. Um, it probably was widespread in different parts of Southeast Asia at that time time um, obviously it wasn't just present in Guangzhou um, but and that's probably where it originated uh, somewhere in Southeast Asia southern China uh, but it spread since then through to, through Japan um, down to Australia farther farther west to Sri Lanka and India and ultimately by the certainly by the 1950s it was present in various Pacific Islands, Tahiti, um, the Samoan Islands, um, Cook Islands, and of course, Hawaii. And since then, it's been found on the US mainland, in southern parts of the US mainland, south, the southeast particularly. Mm -hmm. um, it's spread to uh, 
Canary Islands, it's spread to Mallorca in the Mediterranean, it's in Africa, um, have I missed anywhere? That's, that's basically its current distribution. It's, it's spread rapidly from its original um, region of origin in, in, in southern Southeast Asia. So, Dr. Kawi, one of the most, well, it, maybe the most important thing about this parasite is its life cycle. It's pretty complex, and it's uh, really important to understand it, to understand human infection. I'd like to go ahead and give you a few minutes to go ahead and talk about that life cycle. Sure, no problem. Um, so this parasite, as an adult worm, is about um, between two and three and a half centimeters long. So that's quite a big worm. It's it, that's over an inch, um, and it, it's it, the adults live in the pulmonary arteries of rats, and that's where they mate and reproduce, males and females. Um, the the females lay eggs, and those eggs are transported in the bloodstream from the pulmonary artery to the lungs, and there they hatch into what we call first stage larvae, so hatchling larvae, if you will. Those first stage larvae then move up the trachea, the windpipe, and are swallowed and ultimately um, passed in the rat's feces, um, which are then out in the environment containing these first stage larvae. And the next step is that a snail or slug comes along and eats those that rat poop and ingests those first stage larvae. In the snail or slug, those first stage larvae develop through the second stage to the third stage. It takes about um, takes about three weeks, and at that point they become dormant in in the snail. And, but that's the infectious stage. Remember, and that's important to remember, the third stage larvae are the infectious larvae. And what happens then is that a rat comes along and eats that snail or slug and ingests those third stage larvae. And so the rat becomes infected. The, the worms go down into its gut and from its gut, they move through the circulatory system through various organs and very rapidly, within a matter of maybe a day, they reach the, the, the rat's brain. Um, and there they hunker down and start feeding and moving around and pass through the fourth stage to the fifth stage, which are subadults. Those subadult worms leave the brain and return to the circulatory system and ultimately end up in the pulmonary artery where they mature and mate and produce first stage larvae, which are defecated and the cycle goes round and round and round. And that's the natural cycle that this parasite, um, this parasite reproduces and, and so on. So, so oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was, gonna, I was gonna say, I just wanted to make sure. So the rat is the definitive host. This is where the worm is going yeah. to mature. Correct, that's the, yeah. that's the definition of a definitive host is right. where the parasite matures. The snails are called intermediate hosts. Right. And later on in the interview, we're going to come on to a different kind of host, which we'll discuss um, sure. in due course. So I think the next the next issue then, following on from that background about the parasite's natural life cycle, is how people get infected. Because this, this is a serious disease. It's a rare disease, um, but it can kill you. Uh, if, if you ingest sufficient uh, numbers of worms, infectious worms. And the normal way that we anticipate, we feel that people generally get infected, certainly here in Hawaii, is by ingesting a small snail or slug that's hiding away in, say, in leaves of the lettuce. Um, and sometimes people have eaten, and it has to be raw because if, you, if, you, if it's cooked, then the worms are killed. So it has to be a raw snail or slug. And as crazy as it may seem, there have been people who 
um, have eaten a, eaten a snail or a slug on a dare. In fact, um, there was one story of a guy, he was, a, he was a, in the military and he was on maneuvers up in the mountains in Hawaii. And they were bivouacking at night, overnight and one of his mates said, oh, look at that snail there, um, big African snail introduced. I bet you wouldn't eat that. How much? So they come to an agreement. He eats it, and some days later becomes extremely sick. To cut a long story short, he um, went to the uh, to the hospital. It was lucky. He was lucky that the doctor that saw him was aware of rat lungworm disease, because many doctors are not, and that's an issue we can discuss. Um, the The doctor had an inkling that this might have been rat lungworm. Uh, but he asked the patient, have you had any, have you ever played, did you play with a snail? Did you eat a snail or slug? No, sir. No, sir. Because, um, of course, he was embarrassed. Um, and eventually, again, to cut a long story short, he did admit that he'd beaten the snail for a bet. And the, and the physician says to him, uh, well, was it worth it? And the Marine says, hell no. Yeah. Um, I, could, I could see that being uh, an alcohol-induced uh, issue too. That that was that was not in that case because they were out on the movers. Yeah. Uh, there wouldn't have been any alcohol there. But another case, a very sad case in Australia and in other places. Yeah, I'm aware uh, of this one. There was a, a story of two guys in Brazil. Um, the two guys in Brazil, they saw a slug crawling along a wall. And one said to the other, I bet you wouldn't eat that. And the other said, well... I'll eat half if you eat half, so they cut it in half and they both got really sick. Um, the, the guy in Australia, he was a young guy, 19 year old. Um, he'd been drinking, uh, he'd definitely been drinking, just like the Brazilian people have. And he was dared to, to eat a slug, and he did. And he got very sick. Um, and he had long term impacts of this disease, which sometimes happens, sometimes doesn't. The, and I think it's related to, and ultimately he died about eight years after ingesting yeah. that slug. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that's worth bearing in mind is that we think, and it stands to reason, that the severity of the disease that, that you get is related to the number of worms that you ingest. So if you ingest a, a big slug with hundred thousand worms in it then you might get really sick if you ingest one that's only got 10 or a dozen in maybe maybe you wouldn't even notice that you, you were you were sick um, and that's that can be a, a problem with diagnosis because people might be infected but not be diagnosed because they're not showing symptoms or, or very mild symptoms yeah yeah and that they, they really uh jumps into the, my next question, because you've already talked about eosinophilic meningitis. It's, oh. it's fatal once in a while, but not too often. Am I right? Right. Yeah. But there's got to be a lot of just asymptomatic or very mild symptomatic infections. And uh, what, what do you normally see in a, like a mild infection? So I think a mild infection would probably just be a headache. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's a problem because uh, you might go to the, you might have a really bad headache because it can cause um, serious, nasty headache. Um, but people, people can't get rid of it. And they're, they're thinking of killing themselves. It's so, it's so, it's so bad. Uh, you could go to the emergency room, and the doctor would say, "Well, you've got a serious headache. Just take some aspirin or whatever, um, and go away." And there've been instances in which people have been turned away from the emergency room couple of times before before the doctors realized that there's something weird going on and and many doctors are not aware of rat lung disease. Right. It's, it's not a it's not a common disease um, um, the, 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 the severity of it is what makes it a serious serious disease and worth worth investigating and knowing about but many doctors do not um, and so it's misdiagnosed regularly even if people have more serious symptoms, never mind just a, a mild, a mild um, set of symptoms. But to start with, um, 
what generally happens is that people have maybe a, a, a neck ache, shoulder ache. Um, these are some of the common early symptoms. They may have tingling over different parts of their bodies, perhaps depending on whereabouts in the brain the, the worms are, are active. Um, so you could have it all over your torso, you could have it down your legs, you could have it kind of like serious pins and needles, but it can be so serious that you, you, you can't even wear clothes, you can't even bear to have a sheet over you when you're sleeping. Um, that's, that's a fairly common symptom. More serious symptoms could be um, uh, urinary tract and congestive tract malfunction. Um, you can have um, uh, visual malfunction. So sometimes I, I've seen one person who whose eyes looked in, didn't look in the same direction. Um, and in fact, the worms can come out in your eye. Um, that, that's a rather rare event. And generally, it's only one or two. But they can, presumably, they've crawled along the optic nerve or something, and they've reached your eye. Uh, and they'll come out. You can see them crawling in your eye. And they have to be surgically removed. Um, so, on the other hand, you know, a serious case, you go into a coma, and I know one person here in Hawaii that I know for quite some time. Um, he was in a coma for about three months, and the doctors had virtually given up on him. But eventually, he came out of the out of the coma, um, and this is this is oh, over a decade ago, and um, and he still has symptoms. He still has. Um, some difficulty walking his, his speech is a little you can tell it's not quite right um but he's he's made a, a, an amazing recovery from from where he was um in a coma for three months so you know, he could have died yeah you, you know when i listen to you tell the story it's it really reminds me of some other nematodes that uh, the larva migrate and like, like the raccoon roundworm kind of either finds its way to the brain or the eye or maybe just to the muscle tissue or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you, you don't really know of any symptoms at that case. So angiostrongulus that um, if it doesn't migrate to the brain, does it, can it go erratic and migrate somewhere else? I think there's, there's some feeling and there's not, it's not really, well understood but there's some feeling that not all the worms reach the brain yeah um and whether they do any serious damage if they end up lodged somewhere else it's not really understood uh, there's some thinking that uh some of the, the tingling feeling is, is not related only to where the worms are in your brain and connected to different parts of your body mm -hmm. but they've actually um, migrated to those different parts of your body and, and may be causing that, uh, those problems at those parts of your body. But they may end up dying there and, and maybe don't have any further consequence. Right. Um, but there's re really there's a, a lot that's not known about this parasite and its interaction with, with people and other animals. Um, Dr. Cowie, is, is there any satisfactory medicinal treatment for this parasite? Sure. Um, it's generally, there's, there's no definitive protocol, if you will. But what there is, is a general sort of consensus developing that treatment with corticosteroids to reduce any inflammation in the brain is important. Um, and that's particularly important as the as the worms mature because ultimately and i didn't mention this when they so that when you get infected you ingest it and the, and the pathway that the worms follow is the same as it is in a rat except that when they get to your brain they die or just the vast majority of them die and they can't reproduce they just die and it's thought that as they die they elicit a more serious um, inflammatory reaction than just the, 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 the living worms up there do. Of course, they're much bigger at that point too, um, because they've grown. Um, and so, um, 
Yeah, where was I going with that? Um, what was your question? Oh, uh, concerning, <laughs> oh, concerning a satisfactory treatment for this. Oh, yes, of course. I, I mean, do you have to catch it before it gets to the brain with well, anti yeah, let, let me get to that. Um, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the first thing is that people generally do treat with corticosteroids. Um, and it does seem there have been studies, some of it equivocal, some not very convincing, but others convincing that suggest that they reduce things like the, the severity of headaches, the, the um, persistence of headaches. Um, but um, to respond to your, your question about um, other kinds of medications, there is um, there are, there's a group of, of drugs called antihelmintics. Helmet is, is a technical term for a worm. And so antihelmintics are things that kill, kill worms. Um, and, you know, it's like deworming your dog or, right. or, or treating your horse with um, ivermectin, um, which doesn't, by the way, help COVID-19. I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you are. Um, so um, there's a group of, of these antihelmintics, and there's three or four of them that are generally used, one of which is called fenbendazole, one's called albendazole, and they're all in a group called bentamidazole. Um, and they, they kill worms. And you can treat a person with, uh, generally it's albendazole that's used. Um, the problem is um, that it doesn't seem to have as uh, good an effect um, the, the longer you've waited to treat. So it's best to treat it when treat people when at the very early stages of the disease, when they may not even be symptomatic. They may have just thought, oh, oh dear, I've eaten, I've eaten a snail, I've chopped mm -hmm. it to a slug in, in, my, in my salad. And it, there's, there's some people who would argue, you know, at that point, you know that there's a possibility that that um, slug has had uh, rat lungworms in it. And so you, you treat them prophylactically. Um, but it does seem to be becoming something of a consensus that this combination of uh, corticosteroids and antihelmintics is the, the way to treat people. But there's no protocol in terms of dosage, tapering the dosage. That's all very ad hoc. So, well, the patient is getting better, so we'll, we'll taper the dosage. Um, there's no definitive treatment protocol. It's very, very much still in the early stages of development. Um, let's go ahead and dive into the study a little bit. It, sure. it was pu it was published in One Health. Um, uh, Dr. Cowie, can you go ahead and talk about this research and um, your findings, and what do you believe the importance of it is? Sure. So we talked about definitive hosts, the snails and slugs, and we talked about the intermediate hosts, sorry, the definitive hosts, the rats, and the intermediate hosts, the snails and slugs. Um, there's another class of hosts called paratenic hosts. They're also known as carrier hosts, and transport hosts. The worms cannot mature in them, um, but if one of these other animals eats a snail or slug that has third stage, remember those are the infective larvae in it, um, then it becomes infected with those third stage larvae, but they, those larvae don't develop. They remain as third stage, they become dormant, and they'll sit in that paratenic host for as long as, well, no one really knows how long, but a long time, um, perhaps until that paratenic host is eaten by something else, maybe a person. Um, so what this study did was the, the, the literature on paratenic hosts is, is scattered all over um, the, the, the scientific literature in, in um, obscure reports that were never formally published uh, and so on and so forth. And what we did was um, to try, try to pull together the knowledge that's in that body of literature into a single review paper article um, and we did this by searching various databases on, on 
the internet. Um, I've also accumulated a lot of um, literature of, over the, I don't know, 25 or so years that I've been working on this, this parasite on and off. Um, so we incorporated relevant articles from that. And then we looked at the reference lists of these various articles to try and find additional publications that we hadn't come across. And in the end, we ended up with um, around about 140 relevant non-duplicate articles that we based the study on. And what we found was that um, something like, and I forget the number exactly, but something like 30 different species of all sorts of different kinds of animals are able to act as paratenic hosts, holding these infective dormant but dormant larvae in their tissues. And of those, the other goal of the project was not only to find out which animals could act as paratenic hosts, but also to, to uh, try and find out which ones had been associated with causing rat lungworm disease in humans. And we found that 13 of these 30 or so species were able to do that, had been found recognized as being associated with causing the disease in humans. And those included things like frogs and toads, uh, centipedes, believe it or not. I mean, these, of course, have to all be eaten raw. Uh, why someone would eat a centipede beats me. Um, particularly the... Ex accidentally? No, 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 no. Deliberately. On purpose. Okay. I mean, we're, we're talking about... It's only one species of centipede that's been shown oh, okay. to... to, to um, be able to carry rat lungworm, but there's no reason to think that others couldn't. Right. Um, but obviously that um, centipede had eaten a slug or something, and that's how it had got infected. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, this was first reported in southern China, um, that people had deliberately eaten raw centipedes. And that same species of centipede, invasive in Hawaii, has been found to um, be infected with rat lungworm third stage larvae. So it's acting as a paratonic host here in Hawaii, as well as in southern China. Those are the only two reports of centipedes that I'm aware of. But in, in southern China, you can buy raw centipedes in these wet markets um, where you can buy rats and snakes and any number of different kinds of insects and so on. Um, this, this is a, a particularly nasty centipede if you get bitten by one it's excruciating i never have thankfully occasionally i see them in my house and we, we kill them as soon as we see them um, we chop them in two with a shovel um, and i i have to think that the only way you could eat one of these things raw is once you chopped its head off where it's got those nasty fangs that can cause that nasty bite um, so anyway people apparently buy these things in the markets and eat them raw Amazing. Uh, amazing, amazing. Um, frogs, you can kind of understand that. I mean, right. the front cheek frogs, at least their legs. Um, but in Taiwan and Japan, people have been reported eating frogs infected with rat lungworm. And it's, and toads for that matter. And often it's the liver they eat. The liver seems to be, um, often seems to be of medicinal value. Uh -huh. And that, that's why this is done there. In Thailand um, and parts of India and in Sri Lanka, uh, people eat monitor lizards. These are big lizards, you know, sort of 18 inches long. Um, and it's mostly men. Um, and they eat the, not only do they eat the, mus the muscular tissue, so the meat, but they also eat the liver, the gizzard, and the testicles. Um, and it's thought that this increases strength and virility. Um, okay. But, <laughs> but people have actually died from, from yeah, yeah. supposed to make you more virile. Um, anyway, it, I'm sure it tastes very nice, but... Uh, but you're talking about uncooked. Yes, uncooked. Yeah, yeah, I mean... Like, like monitor lizard sushi. Yeah, wow. I mean, uh, we, we eat uncooked beef. I mean, essentially, if you eat a really raw steak, it's essentially uncooked. Um, 
and we talk about cooking these things um, in order to preclude uh, infection by killing the, the larvae that it's, it's harboring. But it has to be has to be well cooked. So undercooked things, you know, a little bit raw in the middle, may also be dangerous. But in any case, to get back to the cryogenic herds, we had um, centipedes, frogs and toads, monitor lizards, shrimp or prawns, whatever you want to call them. Freshwater shrimp prawns in Tahiti is a big deal. Um, people eat eat them raw, and they also make a special kind of dish um, that has a local name um, in which they squeeze out the sort of the juice of the of the prawn, um, and that's been known to be the cause of rat lung lung disease in in the Tahitian islands since the uh, early 60s. And, and in retrospect, um, people, before we knew that there was the connection between the worms and the disease, um, going back into the 1950s and even into the 1940s, retrospectively, we can say those cases were probably rat lung worm disease, even though we hadn't made the connection between the worm and the disease at that point. Um, and that's the case in Tahiti. There was a big outbreak of eosinophilic meningitis in, in, the, in the mid 1950s. Um, now, what else uh, can act as hosts? Well, cows can act as hosts, but it's a, that's only been shown experimentally. And so we, there's no evidence that cows can um, be a cause of uh, rat lung lung disease because maybe they don't. Um, ingest them in, ingest these. Uh, so, Dr. Cowie, if, if, if there's all these, extra, it's, it's already difficult enough for physicians in many parts of the world to recognize rat lungworm via mm -hmm. slugs and snails. Mm -hmm. This has got to make it even more difficult with all these other peritonic hosts. Yeah, I mean, in, in, I think in, in Asia, um, and, you know, before we go on, I should interject there um, that we've never actually discussed the limits of the distribution of these things. This, these are, this is a tropical, subtropical parasite. So if you're in the UK, for instance, where I'm from originally, um, then there's no chance of getting rat lung worm disease. Right. Um, um, we, we, we've just, had that parasite here in Florida. The parasite is all over Florida, yeah. um, but there hasn't yet been a reported human case Correct. of the disease in Florida. There have been cases in Louisiana and Texas, and one case in Tennessee. So it's got as far north as Tennessee. Mm -hmm. um, it, however, physicians need to be aware of this disease, even in places where the parasite isn't present, because travelers coming back from some of these exotic places have certainly um, contracted rat lung lung disease. There have been cases uh, in a number of European countries, in Australia, New Zealand. Um, it's actually in Australia, but there are cases of people coming back from, you know, Pacific Islands, exotic Pacific Islands, where, where they contract the disease. So physicians need to be increasingly aware of it as the parasite spreads around. And, and indeed, as you say, um, they need to be aware that other things other than snails and slugs can actually uh, cause infection. Um, and I think in Southeast Asia, they probably are aware because most of the cases, most of the serious cases have been in Southeast Asia, particularly Thailand, and particularly, uh, and, and also Southern China. Um, in Thailand, they eat a dish um, in which they eat raw freshwater snails um, along with um, some kind of sauce, and it's always associated with drinking alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, and people get that's well known as a, as a, as a disease in, in Thailand. In China, I think um, it's also fairly well known, at least in southern China. Um, and I, I suspect that many physicians are aware of the disease. But in the mainland United States, 
even but, here in even here in Hawaii, I asked my own family doctor oh a dozen years ago um, whether she was aware of rat lungworm disease. She said, "What's that?" And that, it, but that was a dozen years ago, right? Right. Uh, but but it, 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 it hope, Hawaii's had quite a few cases in recent years. I mean, this year has been quiet. But, yes. So I would think that ER physicians and and the like are probably more in tune. Yeah. Um, Not so much. <laughs> I, I would say um, increasingly so. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. But then you've got the problem of diagnosis. If someone's not going to admit that they have a snail, or, or they may not know, rock, or whatever, uh, yeah, they may not know. Um, and if they don't, certainly if they don't know, then the, the physician is going to have to look at this suite of symptoms that we've sort of discussed and think to themselves, well, maybe it's, it, they've got to have that in their mind as a possibility. Uh, and partly, you know, it's this. It's a sort of it's a sort of holistic diagnosis. There's no one thing that will say, "Oh, that's rat lung worm." Yeah. Until until you take and I didn't mention this while we were talking about treatment, doing a spinal tap, a lumbar puncture, and drawing out um, the fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, is the only sure way of finding those heightened levels of eosinophils in in the in the fluid. Um, but at the same time. Has occasionally been the case that someone's actually spotted a worm in there, and you can do you can do um, molecular uh, a molecular approach PCR um, in order to detect the worms, even if you don't actually find the worms. But you can do that um, in the certainly in the spinal fluid, but also um, there's an, a recently developed test that may be able to detect can detect. Um, worm DNA in the blood. So that's a, that's a potentially significant advance. Um, of course, the spinal tap will relieve the pressure in your brain and reduce headaches. Um, so that's something that would be prescribed um, simply simply in order to release this excruciating headache, never mind the, the, the drugs that are being prescribed as well. So, Dr. Cowie, concerning prevention, I mean, besides the obvious of, hey, don't eat slugs or snails, <laughs> um, what, what else? Uh, make sure your lettuce is washed in the salad. And I mean, what, el what else do you got? Uh, right now, I've just got a cramp in my leg. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, no, no problem. No problem. I think that the, the key things are to try and control uh, the snails and slugs and rats around your, your habitation. Um, and, you know, I have I have rat lungworm in my yard. I mean, we've tested some of the snails in my yard. Mm -hmm. uh, even if we hadn't tested them, I would assume that it's in my yard because in, in our research, we've been all over the, the, the Hawaiian archipelago and pretty much everywhere we've looked, we've found rat lungworm in the snails. Um, and so, I go out in, in the evening and collect slugs, and sometimes I get two, sometimes I get forty, and I stick them in a plastic bag and put them in the freezer. And when they're, then I fill up the plastic bag and put it in the trash. Um, but you can put out snail bait. My wife puts out snail bait because of the plants in the yard, um, and we even have we have rats um, pretty much every every everywhere in the suburban Hawaii has as rats um, and so we notice rats um, we've found dead ones in our pool um, and um, so we've got the, the, the pest control people to come and put bait traps out for the rats and you know it doesn't kill the rats there right there the, the rats eat the bait and go away and die somewhere else and so um, we, we test the bait check the baits every three months and yeah, you can see that there have been rats that have been eating it. Um, and so it's presumably working. But it's an ongoing battle. I mean, mm -hmm. We're not eradicating rats from our yard. We're certainly not eradicating, eradicating snails and slugs from our yard. But controlling them is, is a help. Furthermore, as far as the snails and slugs are concerned, you can, um, it's important 
not to leave a load of trash around the yard, you know, a pile of broken um, pots or a, or a bunch of um, uh, old wooden planks or something where snails and slugs would love to hide, um, all covered in weeds. That's not a good thing. Clean it up, make it all neat and tidy, and that would mean that there's fewer places for snails and slugs to hang out, fewer places for them to reproduce and increase their population. So you're keeping the population down just by keeping the yard nice and tidy. Um, so those are some of the things that you can do. Uh, there's, there's not a huge lot you can do. If you, obviously, if you grow your own produce, then inspect. We have parsley, in a big big pot of parsley in, in our yard, and I inspect every leaf before I eat it. <laughs> no, I think I would too. And, 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 and I know, I know um, this year the giant African snail has been right. found in parts of Florida again after... Yes got eradicated and that is a risk too right it doesn't matter what kind of snail right uh the giant african snail can carry this parasite for sure yeah. um some some species of snails when i say snails I mean snails and slugs the same mm -hmm. thing um, uh some species don't seem able to carry it other species seem less able than others to carry it um and we don't know why that is it may be that these slugs don't particularly like eating rat poop. Right, right. Um, I mean, often you see slugs on dog dudes for um, uh, sometimes loving it. Um, but maybe, <laughs> maybe not all slugs do. Yeah, maybe. So, mm -hmm. that, we don't know. Um, that's that's a, a question that we'd, we'd have to ask. Furthermore, um, the uh, there's also the fact that the insides of the, of the slug or snail, like its physiology, its immunology and so on, could determine whether it's a good host of rat lungworm. So there's variability, but the, 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 the default assumption has to be that the snails in the yard can carry it. Okay. Yeah, I, I remember hearing a story, I think it was out of Jamaica a number yes. of years ago, where somebody contracted it and was in such a tiny little snail that was within their salad they had no idea it was there and right and uh so that's, i mean that's a classic study because it was it was a bunch of um university of chicago or one of the chicago universities um medical students they've gone on a dozen of them have gone on some big jaunt at the end of the semester or something spring break or whatever to jamaica and the last night of their vacation they all went to a restaurant and half of them had the Caesar salad and half of them did not. The ones that had the Caesar salad got sick, the ones that did not, did not. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was, that's a often cited um, publication showing that uh, salad probably harboring snails and slugs is a, is a, a danger. Well, let me go ahead and bring up the study. And it's entitled... Uh, paratonic host of angiostrongness cantonensis and their relation to human neuro and <laughs> this is a mouthful neuro angiostrongulitis <laughs> globally and that's published in one health and um, dr cowie is the uh lead author and if you're interested in taking a look at it i will link to it in the show notes when i publish the podcast uh, it's, open, dr. It's, open, it's open access by the way yes so okay. anyone anyone can access it and um, I should I should add I should add that all the, I'm the, the lead author, which is uh, my name's last the first author, was a, a master's student um, whom I supervised at a distance over Zoom. Uh, she, I was here in Hawaii. She was in London at, the, at London University doing her master's degree in One Health. Um, so it was it was a lot of fun. Good. Oh, good. Well, she was very lucky to have you to uh, <laughs> to work on that study. Uh, Dr. Cowie, last question. Any final thoughts on this topic? Uh, and then we'll close out. I would say um, just be careful what you eat. Yeah. I mean, it's That's really it. that simple, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. M much like with oh, many, actually, many actually, other people. No, actually, no. One final thought. One yes, final thought. A lot of people, and I mentioned... 
going to mention this earlier. A lot of people ask me, can you get it from the slime, the snail, snail, snail tra trail slime? And the answer is, we're not sure. Um, there have been a few studies that um, have had equivocal results, really. Maybe there's a few worms released, maybe there's none at all, maybe not enough to cause illness. We're in the middle of a study right now in which we're trying to do a, a more comprehensive study and you just have to uh, wait and see what the results of that are because we're not sure ourselves yet. Well, that'll be interesting. Let me know when that's published. I would like to take a look sure. at that. Sure, we'll do. All right. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Robert Cowie, for sharing your time and expertise and congratulations on the paper. Thanks. Good work. Thanks for the invitation again. I've enjoyed talking to you.